And before continuing Canto 14, I would like to recall an aspect of the mission of Savitri that is essential and central. We heard from the Divine Mother when Aswapati petitioned her to send forth a ray that would alleviate the, the human struggle and facilitate its evolutionary advance. And she assented finally to his request, um, although first he heard that the supermind could not be forced to, to descend and that could happen only when the world was ready. However, in missioning Savitri into this earthly plane, there was one primary purpose that could be achieved by her spirit and significantly um, impact fate. And this became uh, the, uh, the foremost aim of Sri Aurobindo's yoga and uh, the purpose of Savitri. And that is the conquest of death. And so the, um, the Divine Mother said um, in uh, response to Aswapati's call in the most central canto of all, Strength shall be with her like a conqueror's sword. And from her eyes the eternal's bliss shall gaze. A seed shall be sown in death's tremendous hour. A branch of heaven transplant to human soil. Nature shall overleap her mortal step. Fate shall be changed by an unchanging will. And when Savitri, the goddess, locates the ready human being with whom she shall unite for this yoga of the conquest of death, and she returns to her, um, her heavenly home, and she meets there uh, Aswapati and Narada and she is told that she will have one year uh, in which to achieve this work. She, she is well aware then of her mission and when she comes back to earth the, and um, unites with Satyavan, she announces, or the, the narrator announces um, in very emphatic terms, her attitude and her strength to undertake this task. These lines at the beginning of the um, union with Satyavan indicate to us the importance of this typical tantric goal of conquering death 
that is then developed fully in the last four books of Savitri. And we have heard in, in, our, in our workshop um, on death um, how it is possible when, um, when the soul leaves the body at death if it is united with this force of Savitri then it uh, isn't necessary for it to repeat the karmic patterns that are typical to the human being because it has a will, the will of the divine itself, to um, pass through death and achieve rebirth um, for the purpose of the new consciousness, manifestation of the new consciousness. So this will, of which Savitri is the incarnation, is announced in this way. As if self-poised above the march of days, her immobile spirit watched the haste of time, a statue of passion and invincible force, an absolutism of sweet imperious will, a tranquility and a violence of the gods, indomitable and immutable. At the end of our workshop, I will read some lines from the part of Savitri that um, depicts the liberation of this will at the moment of death. And the death of Satyavan occurs uh, almost immediately after Savitri's yoga is completed and she realizes her union with her higher self. And so if we take this, this work, uh, this work of Savitri, the mantra, uh, in an allegorical way and understand through it uh, the, the mission of the conquest of death, then we can undertake the, the reception of this new consciousness and force as um, a divine fiat intended to achieve this goal as a way to um, bridge the human and the superhuman and experience in our lives a liberation from all the karmic sheaths that we have accumulated uh, and through yoga be prepared at the moment of death to go forward with that, um, the, the empowerment of the divine will in us, the, um, the embodiment of Savitri in us, and continue this yogic process uh, through death and rebirth. Now, in this early canto that I'm uh, concluding right now, we have a, an in, a strong indication that... Um, this, process, this yoga of Sri Aurobindo 
um, is, is used to experience death long before it's time to drop the body. In fact, he realizes that, uh, that liberation and enters into uh, what he calls um, the, um, the chamber of um, rebirth and uh, foreknowledge of the future while still very much um, in the body doing the yoga of ascent. And so that's what we hear in this section in Canto 14. The world soul. Immersed in voiceless internatal trance, the beings that once wore forms on earth sat there in shining chambers of spiritual sleep. Past were the pillar posts of birth and death. Past was their little scene of symbol deeds. Past were the heavens and hells of their long road. They had returned into the world's deep soul. All now was gathered into pregnant rest. Person and nature suffered a slumber change. In trance, they gathered back their bygone selves. In a background memories, foreseeing muse, prophetic of new personality, arranged the map of their coming destiny's course. Heirs of their past, their future's discoverers, electors of their own self-chosen lot, they waited for the adventure of new life. A person persistent through the lapse of worlds, although the same forever in many shapes by the outward mind unrecognizable, assuming names unknown in unknown climes, imprints through time upon the earth's worn page, a growing figure of its secret self, and learns by experience what the spirit knew, till it can see its truth alive and God. Once more they must face the problem game of birth, the soul's experiment of joy and grief, and thought and impulse lighting the blind act, and venture on the roads of circumstance, through inner movements and external scenes, traveling to self across the forms of things. Into creation's center he had come. The spirit, wandering from state to state, finds here the silence of its starting point in the formless force and the still fixity and brooding passion of the world of soul. All that is made and once again unmade, the calm, persistent vision of the one inevitably remakes. It lives anew. Forces and lives and beings and ideas are taken into the stillness for a while. There they remold their purpose and their drift, recast their nature and reform their shape. Ever they change, and changing ever grow, and passing through a fruitful stage of death, and after long reconstituting sleep, resume their place 
in the process of the gods until their work in cosmic time is done. Here was the fashioning chamber of the worlds. An interval was left twixt act and act, twixt birth and birth, twixt dream and waking dream. A pause that gave new strength to do and be. Beyond were regions of delight and peace. Mute birthplaces of light and hope and love, and cradles of heavenly rapture and repose. In a slumber of the voices of the world, he of the eternal moment grew aware, his knowledge stripped bare of the garbs of sense, knew by identity without thought or word. His being saw itself without its veils. Life's line fell from the Spirit's infinity along a road of pure interior light, alone between tremendous presences under the watching eyes of nameless gods, his soul passed on a single conscious power. Towards the end, whichever begins again, approaching through a stillness, dumb and calm, to the source of all things, human and divine. There he beheld in their mighty union's poise, the figure of the deathless two in one, a single being in two bodies clasped, a diarchy of two united souls, seated, absorbed in deep creative joy. Their trance of bliss sustained the mobile world. Behind them, in a morning dusk, one stood who brought them forth from the unknowable. Ever disguised, she awaits the seeking spirit. Watcher on the supreme, unreachable peaks. Guide of the traveler of the unseen paths. She guards the austere approach to the alone. At the beginning of each far-spread plain, pervading with her power the cosmic suns, she reigns, inspirer of its multiple works and thinker of the symbol of its scene. Above them all she stands, supporting all, the sole omnipotent goddess, ever veiled, of whom the world is the inscrutable mask. The ages are the footfalls of her tread, their happenings the figure of her thoughts, and all creation is her endless act. His spirit was made a vessel of her force. Mute in the fathomless passion of his will, he outstretched to her his folded hands of prayer. Then, in a sovereign answer to his heart, a gesture came as of worlds thrown away. And from her raiment's lustrous mystery raised, one arm half parted the eternal veil. 
a light appeared, still and imperishable. Attracted to the large and luminous depths of the ravishing enigma of her eyes, he saw the mystic outline of a face. Overwhelmed by her implacable light and bliss, an atom of her illimitable self, mastered by the honey and lightning of her power, tossed towards the shores of her ocean ecstasy, drunk with a deep golden spiritual wine, he cast from the rent stillness of his soul a cry of adoration and desire and the surrender of his boundless mind and the self-giving of his silent heart. He fell down at her feet, unconscious, prone. <laughs>